As the title might suggest, this video is the second part in a series on the standard model of particle physics. If you haven't seen the first video, I would highly suggest watching that video first, since I'll be referencing it a few times in this video. You can click the note in the corner, and I'll leave a link in the description for you to check that video out. So, before the standard model, before quantum field theory, and even before most of the foundations of quantum mechanics, Erwin Schrödinger, the same Schrödinger from the Schrödinger equation and Schrödinger's cat, almost developed a theory which unified quantum mechanics and special relativity. The main equation of this theory, later to become a main feature of quantum field theory known as the Klein-Gordon equation, had all the features of Schrodinger's equation from non-relativistic quantum mechanics with the added benefit of incorporating all of the symmetries of special relativity. However, he later abandoned it in favor of the non-relativistic version. But why? By that point, it was already well known that special relativity was more accurate than its Galilean counterpart, so what did Schrodinger see as such an unforgivable problem with the Klein-Gordon equation that he was willing to sacrifice the symmetries of special relativity in his theory? In reality, he threw it out because it did not predict the correct fine structure properties of the hydrogen atom due to not taking into account the electron spin. However, it was later pointed out by Dirac that the Klein-Gordon equation had another, perhaps worse, flaw to it. See, when one tries to solve the Klein-Gordon equation for the wave function of a one-particle state, the result depends on the energy of the particle. In special relativity, this energy is determined by the so-called mass shell condition, where E is the energy of the particle, M is the mass of the particle, P is its spatial momentum, and C is the speed of light. Notice that this relation only gives the square of the energy, so if we want to find the actual energy, we need to take the square root of both sides. But when we do this, we end up with two solutions for the energy, one positive and one negative. Now, in physics, we tend to think of the most natural state of the system to be the one which minimizes the energy. In other words, this is the state that the system is happiest in, so we won't see any sort of dynamics going on. As examples, the lowest energy state of a ball on a hill is when the ball is sitting at the bottom of the hill, and the lowest energy state of a mass on the spring is when the spring is neither stretched or compressed. In the case of a single particle state, it makes sense that this most natural state is the one where the particle is not moving. In other words, it's in its rest frame. For the positive energy solution, this is exactly what we find. The smallest value of the energy is when E equals mc squared, which corresponds to zero momentum. As soon as we give the particle some momentum, the energy will increase away from this minimum value. With this in mind, we see the problem with interpreting the negative energy state. Now, the state where the particle is at rest is actually the highest energy state. So, should we be worried that special relativity is completely broken? Well, classically, no. This isn't an issue because in classical physics, energies always change continuously. Since there's a minimum finite gap of 2 mc squared between the positive and negative energy solutions, there's never any way to get between them. So, if all of our physical particles start as positive energy particles, then they'll always stay positive energy particles. This is great, but it's only classical. Once we throw quantum mechanics into the picture, this argument goes out the window. In quantum mechanics, we know that energy can come in chunks, really other particles, which can be spontaneously absorbed and emitted. This means that it's possible to have a physical particle with positive energy, emit some other particles, and jump to a negative energy state. For example, we know that photons and electrons interact. This means that we can have a positive energy electron, emit at least two photons to conserve momentum, and turn into a negative energy electron. So what's the deal? How can we ever hope to make sense of this to allow for a relativistic theory of quantum mechanics? Well, there's a nice, albeit not particularly rigorous, way of handling this issue that, as the tales go, was originally proposed by none other than Feynman. The idea is simple. When we look at a single particle solution to this quantum Klein-Gordon equation, the factors of the particle energy always come multiplied by time. 
So whenever we have one of these negative energy solutions, just take the minus sign from the energy and shift it to the time. Then, as we evolve the particle in time, instead of being a negative energy particle going forward in time, this just looks like a positive energy particle going backwards in time. Okay, so we've solved our negative energy problem, but including particles going backwards in time seems a little distasteful. The good news is that there is another way that we could interpret this to ease our worries a bit more. To see it, let's first think about a positive energy charged particle moving in a magnetic field. We know from classical electromagnetism that this particle will just travel around a closed circle. Whether the particle goes around clockwise or counterclockwise is determined by whether the charge of the particle is positive or negative. So, say we have a negatively charged electron which starts with a momentum pointing towards the top of the screen in a magnetic field which points out of the screen. In this case, the electron will travel in a counterclockwise circle. Now, say we have a negative energy electron, so we know that it is the same as a positive energy electron running backwards in time, so we just reverse time in what we did earlier. This gives us a particle going around the same circle, but instead of going counterclockwise, the particle now goes clockwise around the circle. This is interesting because we would expect a positively charged particle to go in a clockwise circle in the same magnetic field. But we aren't quite done. If we just flip the sign of the charge, this isn't quite good enough. The positive particle will travel in the right direction, but the circle it travels around will be offset from the negatively charged particle. To get the circles to match up, we need to also flip the direction of the initial momentum of the positive particle. Once we do this, we get something that looks exactly like the negatively charged electron traveling backwards in time. Putting this together, we have a bit more savory of an interpretation of these negative energy particles. These just correspond to nearly identical positive energy particles, except with all momenta reversed and all charges, not necessarily just electric, reversed. These charge and momentum reversed particles are known as antiparticles. So in the previous example, instead of having an incoming positive energy electron emit two or more photons and turn into an outgoing negative energy electron, we can more happily interpret this as an incoming positive energy electron and an incoming positive energy anti-electron, meeting up and annihilating into two or more photons. This anti-electron is also given the name of a positron. The positron can now be treated as a completely independent particle with exactly the same mass and spin as the electron, but positively charged rather than negatively charged. What about the photon? Well, photons are neutral, so flipping their charge does nothing. So an antiphoton will just look like a normal photon traveling in the opposite direction. Since the two are identical, we say that photons are their own antiparticle. Okay, so to get here, we've talked about reversing time, charges, and the direction of momenta in our system. All of these are taking our system and doing something to try to change it. In other words, these are all transformations we can perform on our system. In fact, we give these transformations the special names of C for the transformation which flips the sign of charges, called charge conjugation, P for the transformation which reverses the direction of momentum, called parity, and T for the transformation which changes the direction of the flow of time, called time reversal. Note that more generally, parity reverses all spatial directions, similar to how time reversal acts on the time direction, and flipping the direction of momenta is just one effect of parity. Now, these transformations are a bit different from those I talked about in the last video, such as rotations and translations. For the latter, we can transform by as much as we want. We can translate a system by a millimeter or a kilometer, or any increment in between. However, for C, P, and T, we either do the transformations, or we don't. There's no in-between. For this reason, we call transformations like C, P, and T discrete, while transformations like rotations and translations are continuous. 
As I briefly mentioned in my last video, Nether's Theorem only applies for continuous transformations, so there are no conservation laws which correspond to symmetries under C, P, and T. But are these discrete transformations even symmetries? They aren't required by special relativity, so it's feasible that we could have quantum field theories where these are not symmetries. As it turns out, all three, and thus any of their combinations, are actually good symmetries of quantum electrodynamics. However, this is a bit curious. As we've said, exchanging particles with their antiparticles is equivalent to flipping their charges and momenta, which is just a combined C and P transformation called a CP transformation. Equivalently, we could do a T transformation to get a particle running backwards in time. If CP is a good symmetry, that means that if we start with a system that has no particles, such as the very early universe, and introduce some way of producing particles, by the end, we should be able to switch all particles with their antiparticles and get the same result. This means that we should always produce particles and antiparticles in equal amounts. If this was the case in the early universe, then by now we would expect all particles to find their antiparticles and annihilate with them leaving nothing but radiation. So why do we see such an abundance of particles over antiparticles? We have to conclude that somehow CP symmetry must be violated in order to see a universe full of matter. As we will later see, the weak and maybe strong interaction does indeed violate CP symmetry and allows for a way to produce particles over antiparticles. Unfortunately, it still isn't enough to explain the matter we see in the universe. The puzzle for the necessity for extra CP violation is one of the outstanding questions driving the search for new physics beyond the standard model today. Okay, so what have we learned from this? Well, we now know that whenever we add a new particle to the standard model, we also have to add its antiparticle if it isn't already its own. We also have added rich new possibilities to the physics which we can test and apply. For example, the introduction of antiparticles allows for processes which can produce pairs of electrons and positrons from high energy photons interacting with matter, or even other photons. We also already discussed the fact that electrons and positrons can annihilate each other into photons, a phenomenon which is used today in medical imaging through the use of positron emission tomography, or PET scans. So antiparticles and CPT transformations are not only interesting from a theoretical standpoint due to their rich phenomenology, but also have found their way into applications, some of which have life-saving potential.